church is one foundation is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From him he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her and for her life he died. Good morning. And welcome to worship with Mount Zion United Methodist Church and Scottsville United Methodist Church. We are delighted to have you with us this morning. If you're watching on Facebook, please leave a comment so that we can know you're out there. One announcement this morning is that the church office has eight copies available of the upper room. If you would like to have one mailed to you, please let Stacy know and we'll be sure to get that out to you as soon as possible. Now let's center our hearts for worship. Thank you, Sharon, and good morning, children of God. It's good to see you on this Sunday morning. I'm actually recording this on Saturday afternoon in our home in Midlothian. Um, so you'll hear from time to time the sounds of the neighborhood as well as the sounds of the outdoors, some birds flying by. But I hope that the sound you'll listen for most is the sound of God speaking to your heart this day. And to that end, I invite you to uh, listen to these words calling us to worship. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Our opening hymn this morning is Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Let us pray. Yours, Lord, is the glory in everything I see. A country scene, mountain stream, sunrise, sunset, rain, and snow. Yours, Lord, is the glory wherever I go. 
Yours, Lord, is the glory in everything I hear. A roaring sea, bumblebee, laughter, loving, a tender poem. Yours, Lord, is the glory wherever I might go. Yours, Lord, is the glory in everything I feel, a special place, a warm embrace, accepted, helped to become whole. In silence, let us continue to offer our praise and thanksgiving to God. Amen. For our scripture lesson this morning, we are continuing to read from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. I invite you to listen for the word of the Lord. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. loving and gracious God. This morning I pray that you will take my words and speak through them. That you'll take our thoughts and think through them. And that you'll take our hearts and set them on fire. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Did you ever read someone else's mail? And I guess by someone else's mail, I'm really thinking about picking up a letter written by someone that you didn't know to someone that you didn't know, dealing with a time and place that you weren't familiar with. If so, did you understand what you were reading? Carla Works was one of my professors at Wesley Theological Seminary, and she gave our class a fascinating lesson in reading Paul's letters. She told us that we were reading someone else's mail, and unless you know the context, there's no way you can fully understand the message. If you don't know the background, the geographical references, the people who are mentioned, the nature of their relationships, and the issues that are being addressed, whether directly or in between the lines, you can't understand fully the letter that you are reading. We so often lose sight of this when we read Paul's letters. We are reading a real letter from a real person written to real people about real issues. It's also so easy to lose sight of the changes that occur in people over the course of time. This letter that we're reading this morning 
was written at a particular time in the course of Paul's life. The Bible scholars tell us that this letter was written somewhere around the year 50 AD, about 20 years or so after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it was written about 10 or 12 years before Paul himself died, most likely at the hand of Rome. Now, a letter written by Paul somewhere around 50 AD probably is much different in tone and content than a letter he might have written 15 years earlier, say, just before he left Jerusalem to go to Damascus. And it's much different in tone than one of the later's, later letters that he wrote, such as his letters to Timothy. When I read these eight short verses, there are lots of questions that come up in my mind. For example, Paul says that he and his companions had suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi. I wonder what happened there. What did Paul do or say in Philippi that got him into trouble? How did it change him? Did it change his message? Did it drive him underground for some period of time? Paul says that we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel in spite of great opposition. It sounds like Paul had run into trouble in Thessalonica as well. What was that opposition like? Were people undermining his ministry? Outright criticizing him? Did Paul get arrested? thrown in jail? He doesn't give us any of these details. Yet, as Paul seems to remember his time there, he must have loved the people there. He says that he and his companions were gentle among them, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. In fact, he says, so deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you have become very dear to us. Now, these little tidbits that are scattered through today's lesson actually shed new light for me on a verse that I almost read past. It comes up in verse 4, where Paul says, Just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. Paul goes on to say that they didn't try to flatter the people of this community, nor did Paul try to seek praise from them or from any other mortals for that matter. He had one driving purpose and one purpose alone, to please God. And all of this brings me to the question for today's sermon. What does it mean to please God? And I don't just mean for Paul writing almost 2,000 years ago. What does it mean for us to please God today? We sometimes use the phrase to please in a negative way. Paul does himself. He recognizes that he could have approached the people of Thessalonica in a pandering way, trying to please them, to seek their approval by living up to what he thought might have been their expectations, whether real or imaginary. Sometimes we might even struggle just as much to please ourselves, to live up to our own standards. So often we set unrealistic expectations for ourselves and then we struggle when we fail to meet them. Paul refused to do that because he had a higher calling, a calling to please someone else, to please God. And in trying to please God, yes, he's still trying to seek approval, but to do so he is not pandering, he's not using empty phrases to flatter the Almighty. 
His mind is focused on one thing, to do the will of God. Or, to put it in even simpler words, to do as best as he understands it what God wants him to do. Did Paul always get it right? No. Did Paul ever have to be redirected? Yes. Did he sometimes get into disagreements, even with his fellow Christians, in trying to understand what the will of God was? Yes. But using words that we quoted last week from Paul's letter to the Romans, he did his best to discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So, I wonder, where did Paul receive his example of single-minded devotion to the will of God? Where did he learn to please God? Somewhere deep in his soul, he must have thought that his early efforts to persecute the Christians actually was an effort to please God, and Paul was single-minded in that effort. But at least in that case, Paul was wrong. And Paul needed a change in direction while on the road to Damascus to realize that his sincere efforts were nonetheless misguided. You see, discernment is not a one-time thing, but we constantly need to be checking and rechecking our bearings and our compass points to make sure that we are seeking to please God, to do what God wants, instead of trying to seek the approval of our family, friends, our bosses, our leaders, or even ourselves. But there is something else that we need to recognize. Jesus himself demonstrated that pleasing God isn't necessarily to be measured by how good or how religious it makes us feel. There may be times of great spiritual consolation when we feel so affirmed in what we do, when we feel maybe like we imagine Jesus must have felt at his baptism when he heard that voice from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. But there are also times when doing the will of God leads to tough times, tough choices, times where we need to pray that prayer that we repeated last week, not my will, but yours be done. We've been touching on this theme the last several weeks about uh, obedience to God and what God asks us to do. And I wish that there was a way that we could be certain, absolutely crystal clear on just what it is that God wants us to do and God wants us to be. I've been learning that God's will is likely to be discovered not by looking for outward signs and signals, but by looking inwardly, looking to the light of God within us, showing us the way, and then can, we need to continually check and recheck to make sure that what we are seeking is God's will and not our own. But there is one thing we need that is up to us. We need to want, to desire, to do God's will. And yet sometimes we don't. The late Thomas Merton, a spiritual writer and mystic, expressed this dilemma in this way, in this prayer. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope, 
I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore will I trust you always. Though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. So friends, this morning, I need to ask you directly some pretty tough questions. What are the deepest desires of your heart? Who do you want to please? If you, like me, want to please God, what will you be willing to give up in order to please Him? And will you be willing to trust Him to lead you by that right road? May it be so. Amen. God, what a privilege it is to know that you invite us, you call us as your children to follow you, to do what you ask. And we get so caught up and bound up in uh, trying to figure out just what that is, and yet you give us some very simple guidelines. What do you require of us but to love justice, to do mercy, and to walk humbly with you? We want to do that this morning, God. And I pray that you'll rekindle that wanting to in our lives later on today and this evening when we go to bed and in the morning when we wake up and throughout every waking moment of our lives. I pray, God, that you'll help open our eyes to see the needs of your children around the world and that you'll awaken us to the things that we might do to share your love and compassion with them. This morning, O oh God, we do lift up to you the needs that are on our hearts for 
Peggy Spradlin and her family as they mourn the loss of Duck. For the health and safety of our governmental leaders and the candidates for office. For Gilbert Riggins, friend of the Wormsers. For Harvey Sorum. John Allen Boggs. Carter Conrad. Dan Dowdy. Agnes Johnson. Bev Butler, Grady Lassiter, Eileen Piller, the ministry and participants with Hope Beyond the Bars, all those impacted by natural disasters, including yet another wildfire, all of those affected by COVID-19, and all of those who are working so diligently to bring relief from the pandemic. Those who are recovering at home, those who are caregivers, our shut-ins dealing with physical pain and the pain of isolation. And Lord, we lift up to you the names that are on our hearts. Into your loving hands, O oh God, we place all for whom we pray, trusting in your infinite mercy and steadfast love. And we pray with confidence as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Take My Life and Let It Be. Next Sunday is November 1st, All Saints Day, a day that we honor the saints who have been so much a part of our lives. If you have the name of a saint who has departed this life that you'd like for us to lift up, I hope you'll send me a note letting me know so that we can include them in our remembrance. God invites us all 
to do his will, to love him fully and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We can do this with God's help. As we leave this place, let us go forth to love, knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you and me now and forever. Amen. Peace.